All right, so I didn't get to leave the stage. I get to stay here. So um, as Fabian said, I'm Kevin Fleming. I work at Bloomberg in New York City. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes teaching you a little bit about who Bloomberg is and what we do and how that affects the tools that we use to accomplish those things. And then, of course, as a result, how that means we contribute, use and contribute back to open source software. So I suspect that most of you don't really know much about Bloomberg if you've had any interaction with Bloomberg at all. It may be that you've seen um, Bloomberg as a media company, news, radio, magazines, other things like that. And we certainly are that kind of company. We have a global news organization. But our primary product is the one that we have, uh, that I have pictured here, which is a platform that is used by something more than 300,000 people around the world in order to make decisions that um, affect financial uh, products, financial investment decisions, trading decisions, and other things along those lines. Those are people at banks and people at large companies and all, everything in between. Um, we make a, a very large suite of products around doing that. And as you can imagine, in order to actually be able to provide this service to people, we have to gather massive amounts of data. Now, we're not what you would call a big data company in the sense of, say, Google or Facebook or somebody like that. The data sets we're talking about here are not on that scale, although they're still very large. But they have a lot of really interesting attributes, which I'll go over in a minute here. So, as I mentioned uh, just a little bit ago, the company's been around for about 35 years. Uh, this predates PCs and smartphones and all of the other things that we all take for granted nowadays. Um, so today, thinking about having easy access to information, everybody just assumes it's readily available. It will be on the internet, and that means it's in your pocket because you've got it on your smartphone. This was not the case, of course, 35 years ago. So all of this technology, all these tools and systems have been built up in order to solve this challenge for a relatively small community. Obviously, out of the global population, 320,000 people is not a very large percentage. However, a lot of these people make very important decisions every day that do affect the things that we do. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we're a global company. We have people all around the world. Uh, approaching 5,000 engineers who work on building all of these systems. And as I mentioned before, the data, we don't create the data that we serve. That data comes from financial markets and news contributors. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of financial markets around the world, obviously in North America and Europe and Africa and Asia and everywhere else. I think they're on every continent except Antarctica. Um, and so all of these are places where financial trades are occurring and lots of information is being produced. And we gather all of the information from all of those sources and put it all into a single system so that decisions can be made, analysis can be done. Now what that means is when someone is using our system to make these decisions, our system becomes fundamental to the way they make decisions. They, in some cases, they learn the ability to make those decisions using the tools we produce, and if they don't have the tool, then they can't make the decisions that they need to make. That obviously puts a lot of pressure on us to ensure that our systems are reliable, that they're available all the time, that the data is always consistent, that it always appears when it's supposed to appear, and all of that has to continue to happen as the market expands. Over the last, let's say, four or five years, the financial market activity has grown orders of magnitude. I'll show you a chart in a minute. But as it, as it grows, it puts pressure on the tools that we use to build our systems to be able to accommodate that growth. So I mentioned in the panel we just did, um, as many companies are doing, we are beginning to, we use open source software heavily, of course. We use it most heavily in the infrastructure of our, of our systems. So how we actually build and deploy the systems themselves, the tools that our developers use, the operating systems running on many of our servers, the tools we use to deploy applications and configure them and connect to other networks and all those things, there are open source tools all, all through that chain. The more obvious areas are obviously in the DevOps automation world, and you've all seen those tools before. But we also, since we are a news organization and we're a gatherer of news, we are actually the conduit by which many of our users see the news coming out of the world. So we actually gather news from these thousands of sources around the world, coalesce it into a single system, and provide tools to filter and generate alerts and lots of other things. And so we are using now open source tools to build those platforms too. So what does that mean in the scope of a Bloomberg system? 
Um, as you might imagine, there are millions and millions and millions and millions of news stories that appear. Um, we have statistics on this slide here, and of course these are all rough numbers, but um, the interesting things that you might pick out from here, though, are that our users expect to, if they have an alert set in their system, to be told when a news story appears related to some company that they're interested in, they need that story on the screen of their computer within roughly a tenth of a second after the, this time that the story is published. Not a second or five seconds or ten seconds like you might have if it was coming via email, for example, or other tools. They need it there very quickly because they're going to go make trading decisions based on what that story tells them. So the systems that we build not only have to handle large amounts of data, but they have to do it in ways that the response time is low all the time, regardless of the fact that the volume of data might go up dramatically. As you might imagine, recently in the United States, we had an election you've probably heard about. When, when events like that occur, the volume of news stories goes up enormously for a day or two. Or you have a large vote in England, which happened a few months ago. Same sort of thing. The volume of news stories goes up significantly. That also affects the actual market data that I mentioned, and I don't know how well you can see this on the, on the uh, screen there, but I'll walk you through it a little bit. This is a rough chart that shows the volume of market data that's absorbed into our system every day um, at the peaks, and it covers, let's see, 2008, the first part of 2008, through roughly right now. Um, as you can see, it's growing rather rapidly. Um, and that is due to a number of factors. There are more exchanges, there's more activity, there are more computerized trading activities that are generating more trades and more offers and all of those sorts of things. But the interesting thing you can see there is that um, that is right around the beginning of this year, we actually hit a peak rate of 100 billion messages per day of market data, which is a phenomenal number. It's not a number that any of us can actually comprehend. It's too big. What's more important, and unfortunately I can't go into details here because I only have five minutes, is that if I was to expand this chart out, you would see that those 100 billion messages are not evenly distributed across the 24 hours in that day. There are big clusters around when the European markets open and when the New York markets open and when the Japanese and other Asian markets open and when they close. And all of our systems have to be built to tolerate all of that. So. When we go choose tools to build things on, and we of course now primarily focus on choosing open source tools whenever we can, we will frequently find that they are very close but not quite able to handle our systems. And that may be, for example, because a tool that is already something that knows how to build, to be set up in clusters and do failover and load sharing and redundancy and all those other things you need for high availability, it's mechanisms for determining when there's a failover and when there is a need to switch to another node might take as long as half a second or a second in order to decide that that situation has occurred and to move things over to another node. In our world, that's not possible. We don't have a second to wait for that to occur. So in some cases, we will actually go improve these tools in order to be able to respond more quickly. Of course, as was mentioned in some of the previous talks, the fact that it might take that tool a second to make that decision, that's not an arbitrary choice. The people that wrote the software had to make engineering decisions about what is the right thing to do, what are the trade-offs in doing it more quickly or more slowly, and so that means when we make it go more quickly, we have to re-go through those trade-offs and decide, are we willing to give up something that the system did before in order to have it fail over more quickly? So, I'm going to give you two examples of things that we've contributed to the open source community recently as a result of the work we're doing. The first is a tool called BuckleScript, um, which is a, an add-on to the compi a compiler for a language called OCaml, um, which was actually created here in France. Um, and it is a, is a tool that allows you to compile OCaml into JavaScript. JavaScript is an important tool for us not only on our websites, where everybody uses it on websites, we actually use it heavily in our products. Many of the applications that run inside our terminal product are actually built by our developers using JavaScript, and not only in the, on the front end, the part that the user sees, but also on the back end. 
So we have many cases where the performance of that JavaScript is actually dictating how quickly we can get things on the screen. And using tools that allow us to write more efficient and more reliable JavaScript obviously makes our developers more productive. So this is a tool that came out of one of our teams last year. Um, it is a way to be able to take specific portions of a large library of JavaScript and say, we need this part to be faster, or we need this part to have more runtime type safety, and rewrite it in a language that's designed specifically for those things, then compile it into JavaScript, drop it in place, and be able to benefit from those advantages. So this was actually the first project that we published that gained um, community involvement before we even announced it. Um, this had been sitting on GitHub in a repository for some time as we prepared the code to be released. And then on a Friday afternoon, we decided it was time to release it. So I logged into GitHub and I clicked the button to make it public and I went home. And it came back on Monday morning and the, the communications person who I worked very closely with has said, have you seen what's happening with our Twitter handle this morning? And I said, no, I haven't, what's up? And he said, there are 400 people who have already tweeted about something that we released on GitHub on Friday. And I hadn't even announced it. Apparently in this case, there is some sort of bot that watches for new repositories on GitHub, determines if they're mostly JavaScript, and if they are, it posts on some channel somewhere and lots of people saw it. Since then, we've gotten contributions from lots of other companies. It's being adopted as part of tool chains. So this was a really great success story for us. And then this is another one, which I'll have to cover quickly because I'm running out of time. As you can imagine, in order to do the sorts of things that we do providing analysis tools to our users, we have to do a lot of what's called machine learning, data science, natural language processing. There's lots of different ways to refer to those things. And for any of you who have some experience with what machine learning is, you are teaching a machine how to help people make decisions. In order to do that, you have to build a model that tells the machine how to interpret the data that it's seeing, evaluate all the different features that are present in the data that it's seeing, and then trigger certain actions to occur. Well, those models have to be changed. They, ch they have to be changed frequently because the input changes. Suddenly you have a much larger volume of news stories about a particular kind of event that you didn't have last week when you built the model. Or your users have decided that they want new kinds of alerts that they didn't want before and the model is not generating enough of those alerts. So we had to build a system that would allow the models to be automatically retrained. We've done that, and we built it on top of an open source package called Solar, which comes from the Apache Software Foundation. And we had it actually deployed in production. We've had people talking about it in multiple conferences. And I think about a week and a half ago, the code was actually merged into Apache Solar. So this significant contribution in the way that you deploy Solar and teach it how to do complex query analysis will actually be something that's in the next version, and that was something that we contributed. Another thing that we're quite proud of. So, since I'm out of time, I'll get to my summary slide. That was good timing. Um, so, we have very unique challenges due to the types of data that we process and the needs that our customers place on our systems. In spite of that, we don't always build our own tools anymore. We use lots of open source tools, but we have to enhance them and extend them. And obviously, as other people have mentioned, our goal there is not to go generate our own piece of software. We want to contribute all of that back to the open source community when it makes sense to do so. So we do that, and we're quite happy to do it. And we think this is a great way for a company to participate in open source. Thank you. <laughs>